once I was lost in sin, I had no peace within, to save my weary soul I knew not how, but Jesus came to me, and by his grace I'm free, now it's different, yes it's oh so different now, it's different now, yes, it's different since now. Jesus saved my soul, since he saved my soul, it's different now, yes, it's different since now. by his blood I'm whole, by his blood I'm whole. Satan had to flee when Jesus rescued me. Now it's different, yes, it's all oh, so different now. I went to church one day to hear them sing and pray. The preacher firmly plowed the gospel plow. He said, You must repent. So down the aisle I went. Now it's different. It's different now. Yes, it's different Since now. Jesus saved my soul. Since he saved my soul. It's different now. Yes, it's different Since now. By his blood I'm by his blood I'm whole. Oh, Satan had to flee when Jesus rescued me. Now it's different. Yes, it's all so different now. So different now. And now my hopes are bright. I praise him day and night. How he can change me so I know not how. The victory now is won, now it's different, oh, so different now. It's different now, yes, it's different it's now. Jesus saved my soul, since he saved my soul. It's different now, yes, it's different now. by his blood I'm by his blood I'm whole. Oh, Satan had to flee, when Jesus rescued me. Now it's different, oh, so different now. church this evening. I hope you had a wonderful afternoon, had a good time with your family together this afternoon. Please grab that gold hymn book there in front of you and let's stand and sing hymn 194, When We All Get to Heaven. 194, When We All Get to Heaven. On that first verse, let's sing it. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy. Verse 
number three, sing it. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. before us sing about it onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be home soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold when we all Welcome back to church tonight. So glad that you can be here. And hopefully you got a good afternoon of rest or uh, eating or something. Whatever it did, it brought joy into your heart. And uh, maybe you found uh, a little rest this afternoon in some way. It was a good Sunday morning and a great, great bounce back from Easter. You know, sometimes it's tough because Easter is just absolutely incredible. And you always wonder what the next Sunday is going to feel like. But had a good crowd once again today and great singing, good opportunity to be in church. I'm glad you're back tonight. Looking forward to uh, some more singing and what God has in store. It's going to be a great day. Uh, it says, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And uh, I wonder, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome to see some of you come unglued for the first time. It really is. It really is. It's going to be neat. Honestly, if I man, where was that? You know, I probably won't think that. I'll probably be doing my own set of victory laps or whatever it may be. I don't know. But it's going to be neat to see some of you jump and skip for the first time in a spiritual setting. And, uh, you know, I, I heard a man say a long time ago, he said, I gave so much foolishness and excitement. I danced so much for, the, for Satan. I guess I could be a little happy for the Lord for the rest of my life. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a great day of rejoicing. You know, it could be today. It could be today. Say, I don't know. I thought that before. Yeah, that's what everyone's going to think on that day. And uh, it's going to be an awesome time together. Uh, looking forward to the rest of our service. We're going to, oh, this next song is going to be great. Looking forward to it. But uh, let's ask God to bless the service. I'm glad you're here. Hope you had a good afternoon. And let's ask God to speak to our hearts once again tonight, please, shall we? Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for our church. Thank you for those who are gathered here tonight. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless this evening's service as we've uh, put extra time together now, uh, twice on this Sunday, to try to prioritize you. Lord, I pray you'd help us to think on spiritual things. It's so difficult, Lord, uh, with so much out there in this world and, and uh, that's pulling on us. And Lord, our, help us put our mind to subjection and to just focus on the priority of why we're here. And may we listen for your voice. May we be attentive, Lord, and obedient. I pray that your power and the Holy Spirit would uh, have uh, free reign to do whatever he needs to do to, in our service tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stay standing and sing again. Hymn 250, Under the Blood. 250, Under the Blood. The burden of sin has been lifted. Let's sing it like we mean it tonight. 250 on that first verse. The burden of sin has been lifted as far as east is from west. They're buried without remembrance in God's sea of forgetfulness. I've been to Calvary's fountain. My name is written above when Satan rails accusations. I tell him here under the blood, there are 
like the Passover in Egypt land. It took the blood to save man. Washed and made clean, I'm justified. They're under the blood. On that second verse now, sing it. The prophets of old by the home shores, their faith through the ages doth ring. They've waited so long for the moment, the crowning of Jesus our King. There's Daniel, Elijah, and Noah. They talk of like the post over in Egypt's land. It took the blood to save man. Washed and made clean, I'm justified. There are things of blood. Him 472 now. He's still, he's still on the throne. 472. If our sins are under the blood, he's still on the throne always on that first verse. A sinner now saved, blood washed by the Lamb. My brother's a king, the son of I am. Sometimes I forget. stormy winds blow. I'm reminded today, thank God I am saved. Salvation, sweet song, while ages roll on, he's still on the throne. Turn the page to that second verse there. Old Satan has power sometimes I'm at times I give up, and he walks over me. Then sometimes I, with words loud and strong, arise, my child, it is I, and I'm still. The stormy winds blow. I'm reminded today, thank God I am saved. Salvation, sweet song, while ages roll on, he's still on the throne. Amen. You may be seated. If you need a bulletin for this month, if, you've not, if you did not get one this morning, just slip your hand up as the ushers come by. They will be happy to give you a bulletin with all the upcoming events. Again, thank you for everyone that came out yesterday. It made life a lot easier on me and Brother Munoz anyway. So we are so thankful for it. But we had a good turnout. We got a lot done. On the 20th, well, this Saturday, don't forget this Saturday, 1030, or sorry, 1030, 10 o'clock, uh, we are going out soul winning. If you can be here, uh, we did not yesterday because of the work day, but we'll be right back out door knocking, telling people about Christ this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock. If you can be here, that would be great. The 20th, the teenagers are going to Elephant Rock. 
rocks. Uh, we're just asking parents $5 to help with the cost of the food. You know how my wife makes the food for them with all their picnic style lunches. It'll be well worth $5, amen. Uh, if you wanna go parents, you're welcome to go as well, but they need to bring a change of clothes for right after soul winning. We're gonna load up the bus and we're go going to go down to Elephant Rocks. The 21st is our pancake dinner. I do not know what kind of pancakes other than edible, that's all I know. Peanut butter, Nutella, Cool Whip, chocolate chips, all kinds of toppings, syrup, maybe not all those, but we'll have toppings for you. It's donations is what we're asking just to help the teenagers do some work uh, to serve you while they raise money to go to camp. I mentioned this morning we had three saved last year, that's what camp is about. So we're looking forward to see what the Lord's going to do with them this year. Amen. And then the men and boys camp out. That is just around the corner. You can register online. You, you can go through our church app. You can scan the little code in the bulletin. If you're like me and you're not that tech savvy, then just grab a... a offering envelope back there, write your name, how many you're paying for, $8 a person or 25 a family. It'll get to us and we'll know, or just get put it in an envelope and give it to one of the staff so we know who it's for. But it'll be a good time of fellowship, man. Uh, any guys, you don't have to have a son, you don't have to have a dad with you. That's why it's called Men and Boys Camp Out. We just go have a good time, us fellows, in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a few folks, uh, a few more folks sign up today for Men and Boys Camp Out, so thank you so much. A lot of men have jumped in to get involved with that. Uh, we've, we've had some non-members jump in and register for it before some of our members have even done that. That's always interesting, but I'm looking forward to a great group of men. Be a part of it, uh, please. It's, it'll be, it's a, be a great time together for you. And uh, just, uh, I, I always look forward to that time of fellowship. We don't get a lot of designated times like that for the men, but this is absolutely uh, one of those. And then uh, let's, we'll support the teenagers. I know we will. We want to uh, be a blessing to them as they get ready for camp. And uh, camp is a, a highlight of the calendar year for the teens, and, uh, but it definitely is some cost to them. And so let's please uh, be generous. We, uh, you know, say, well, uh, you know, I want to test the food first. Just, just donate first, all right, before you eat the food. And, uh, you know, th just that way you won't feel regretful at all in any way. I'm sure it's going to be great if the tenants are heading that up. I'm, the food's going to be good. You know that, all right? So uh, that'll be a great time. You don't have to cook that night. You can stuff yourself full of some good carbs on a Sunday night. But we know that they all belong to the Lord that night. So we'll be okay. We'll be all right with that. If you want your uh, caramel, whipped cream, chocolate chip, peanut butter, Nutella, uh, praline, uh, hot fudge pancakes or whatever it is that you want that night. All right. Uh, I hop style. Okay. And, uh, how many, we have any waffle house, uh, aficionados here in our church. Boy, it's been a long time since I've been to a waffle house. Um, I'm, I'm a little nervous about that though. I'll be honest with you because I, I did that with white castle about two years ago. And I said, you know, it's been so long since I've been to white castle. Let's see what it's all about. And I saw what it was all about and uh, tasted it firsthand. And I'm worried about, well, I know there's some, there's some real big, there's a lot of loyalties to, it's not quite Chick-fil-A level, but it's pretty high. I'm telling you, people for Waffle House, but maybe we'll do that one of these days. I, can't, I don't think you can smoke in them anymore, right? You're not allowed to, which that helps. I mean, used to get cigarette butts in the batter and all that kind of stuff. That was just, that was just part of the experience, you know, it was just part of, um, thankfully, <laughs> Uh, that's not the case anymore, I guess. I don't know. Well, I, I, the, the pancakes will probably be better than all that stuff, though. But we're really off the rails now. We're really off the rails. And, uh, yeah, Brother Tennant, he's been, I think he's been sober clean for at least three or four months now. So we're, we're grateful for that. We have to send him out to California in one of those hideaway retreats every few months just to get things right again. It's, it's where all the celebrities go and everything like that. You know, he enjoys all right. I'm just trying to get a just a little smile from you in some way. So if you don't respond, I just I just kick it into the next notch, into the next notch. So if you're like, Pastor, just make it stop, then give me a smile and we'll be good to go. Um, thank you for, for being such a blessing in the morning service. Sing out church. Let's just be a singing church. Can't we do that? Singing out with our whole heart. And as you learn those songs together, he's still on the throne. What a great song to sing. And, and that, was, that was a blessing tonight for sure. 
And a couple other blessings that we've had today. We're grateful we've seen Miss, Mrs. Perry is back with us tonight in church. We were praying for her. And uh, thankfully, the, uh, the test that she had today didn't uncover anything really serious. So, But you pray for her. She's going to be recovering for the next few days. She'll be feeling better soon. But uh, she, she wanted to be back with us tonight. Probably pushed it a little bit, but I'm glad you're here. And so we appreciate uh, God bl blessing us with uh, an answered prayer request that way. And then, and then also the Schneiders had a blessing over this weekend as well. As early this morning, they welcomed another grandson into their family. And uh, Luke Jose was born. And did you get the vitals yet? No. no? He's a baby, though. He's a baby for sure, and so probably pretty tiny, and so somewhere between 5 to 15 pounds, and uh, from 11 centimeters to 50 centimeters long. Okay, that's what we know so far, and uh, but uh, mom and baby are doing okay now, and so, okay. Good. All right. So let's pray for mom, please, if you would. And I'm glad we got that update tonight, but we're grateful that uh, they have another another child in their family. And so pray for mom to recover from what's going on. You know how that is. Uh, all of us have gone through that kind of stuff before. So let's be in prayer for that and uh, continue to be in prayer for Brother Mike Carell, if you would, Amen. with uh, his recovery from those blood clots that he had in his lungs and so just be in prayer for that. Lots to be in prayer for. I wanted to mention our, our missionaries, the Goddards. The Goddards are missionaries down uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, they're, they're getting ramped up really strongly here in the next uh, few weeks trying to get their church planted. They have some needs. Um, we're going to look at that. We've, we've been kind of meeting some needs a lot lately in different areas. But uh, let's be in prayer that God can help meet. They need, you know, PA equipment and printing materials and a lot of things that just happen. We take for granted they're here now. We've, we've built them up over the years, but when you're starting a church from scratch, it's, there's a lot of initial investment, okay? And so let's pray that God will bless them as they're, they're excited to get things going down there, and uh, it's going to be an amazing time for their family. Imagine their excitement, but uh, we, want, we want God to show them, hey, I'm behind you, I'm going to use you. You're surrendered to me. And uh, it's, give me how scary that is, just bringing your family. they got little children, bringing their family down to a, a whole different hemisphere now and, and trying to serve the Lord there and to have the encouragement that you know that the Lord's hand is upon you and people are behind you. So would you pray for them, for the Goddard family? There are missionaries to Trinidad and Tobago, and I know they would absolutely appreciate that prayer. We're going to talk more about missions tonight, um, and we have our business meeting following the service. I just wanted to remind you of that as well. All right, it's time for our offering. Ushers, you come forward, please, if you would. Thank you for being faithful to give to the Lord as he has blessed you. Brother Rick, would you pray for our offering, please, if you would? Amen.
for that and I appreciate their singing together and some good harmony together as well and uh, I tell you it, it will be uh, very beneficial for our church the more and more that we can invest in the young people here um, we 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 don't necessarily have as much control whether or not whether or not God ever explodes our church into some massive place or things like that but it would be uh, definitely a victory for the cause of Christ if our church just we're this, this is what we are through the history of our church, yeah. but we put out these extensions of our church, uh, not only here, but in other places around the world through our young people who are growing up and uh, choosing to serve God with their life as well. And, uh, and whether they decide to do it full time one day as a, as a pastor or pastor's wife or missionary or assistant pastor, whatever it may be, a uh, Christian school teacher, or whether they just choose to be a godly layman somewhere in a church. Uh, for us to be a, a launching pad uh, for godly Christian leaders is, yes. would be a tremendous blessing for our church. It really would uh, to have a heritage and uh, like to keep track of that through the time and history of our church. And uh, a few years down the road, be able to say, you know, we've got we've got 20 some different uh, people serving in churches throughout yes. this nation uh, that grew up in this place and decided to, to serve God with their life. And so uh, more and more, we need to make sure we're uh, not getting tired of investing in them. And so uh, thank you for that, young people. Uh, let's look together at 1 John chapter number 4, please. 1 John chapter number 4. In the evening time, we've been going through the book of 1 John and how the book of 1 John teaches us to have fellowship with God. 
uh, in a variety of different ways. It talks about the light of the Lord and how if we're going to fellowship with him, we need to fellowship in his light. We need to be worthy of that and prepared for that and cleansed for that. We looked at the love of God a little bit. The love of God is going to come up a few different times here in the book of 1 John. Uh, the love of God and how to have a life that's committed to God. All of these things are going to help us have fellowship with him. So every week we've had fellowship through something. What's it going to be tonight? Let's see. Let's take a look. Uh, the last time we, we looked at this subject two weeks ago, uh, before Easter time, uh, we read the first few uh, verses of 1 John 4. The first three verses were talking about how we need to have a uh, fellowship through discernment. Remember that? We talked about that there's a lot of voices out there. They're not all correct. We ought not to just be gullible and follow anyone that stands up and say, God said that it's okay to do this, or God said we should do this or that. We need to try that uh, spirit and make sure we know that it's of the Lord. So we looked at that two weeks ago on having fellowship through discernment. Let's look at verse number four tonight, please. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. Be that is not, uh, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You can see there's a kind of a joining, uh, an overlapping of topics here, verses 1 through 3 and verses 3 through 6. They kind of overlap each other just a tiny little bit, uh, dealing with still trying to discern between the right and the wrong, who's doing right, who's doing wrong. And uh, we're, we're a little echoey up here, guys. I know I've been asking you to push it a little bit, but I'm getting some, some ring up here on my end. Thank you very much for that. Um, but we've been looking at discernment and looking at the right people and the wrong people. He kind of continues in this a little bit when he says there in verse number four that ye are of God. So he's saying, look, there's going to be people out there that are going to confuse you. They're going to lead you astray. Uh, they're going to uh, say things that God did not say and claim it to be of God. He says, but look, you specifically talking to the Christian world at this time, ye are of God and you've overcome them. In other words, these people do not have to get the victory over you in this life. Okay, the, the fact that there's a lot of people out there and they're putting a lot of things out in the wind, most of it is unbiblical, or I would even say maybe even extra biblical. In other words, uh, God says this and they want to go five steps even farther than what God says uh, in their own mind and call that truth and says everyone has to be like me and think like me. But there's a lot of that. It's everywhere. You don't, you don't have to go far, you know, uh, just a little looking, a little seeking, and you'll find that kind of stuff. But he says, look, uh, you're of God. God lives inside of you. You're born of him now. You're his child. And these people don't have to get the better of you, and they don't have to cause you to go astray and lose fellowship with God because you've allowed the wrong influences to step into your life. You can have victory over these things, it says, and have overcame them. Uh, in other words, these people are in your life. They're available available in your life, but you have victory over these things, okay? And, uh, and so he says, look, they're always going to be around. They're of the world. The world listens to them. The world is going to take notice of them, uh, but you're of God, so you need to be listening to the things of God. So tonight, as we strive to, have, strive to have more fellowship with God, I want 2024 to be a year of greater fellowship for all of us with God, a closer relationship with God. I want you to have more prayers answered this year. I want you to have a greater understanding of God's word this year. I want you to know God in a deeper and more meaningful way that that he's just not some God that's out there, but he's your God and that he loves you and that you can get blessings from him. Uh, I want that this year. I hope and pray that you want that this year as well. So how can we have fellowship with God tonight? We can have fellowship through overcoming. So you can see that word there in verse number four, you have overcome them. So there's an overcoming that is available to us here in this world. Let's start uh, tonight by just talking about the ever-present battle the ever-present battle that's in this life. In other words, everywhere you look, right, it seems like the world is winning. Anywhere you look, in politics, it seems like the, the, uh, uh, the world is winning there, and the devil's winning in the world. In, uh, in our educational system, it just seems like the, the world is winning there in our educational system, in the family unit. It seems like the world is winning there. How do you know? A lot of people chose the world today than being in church as a family. 
They chose something else. It wasn't that they were providentially hindered, that they were sick, or uh, that some emergency cropped up in their life. It was just, it was a choice. And it's sad that we've become a society in the Christian society, not the unbelievers once again. We can get on the unbelievers for you know being the Easter and Christ, uh, Christmas onlys. But that a Christian who loves God says, I'm called by his name and uh, I enjoy his salvation. I enjoy the gift of the Holy Spirit inside of me. But for someone to actively say, you know, once is enough for me in a week. That's about all I can handle of church. I won't make an attempt to go any other times. And they're healthy and they're well. Yeah, it just seems like the world's winning. Like we're trying so hard and the world's winning in every facet. In the, in the family unit, in the, the husband and wife. Or what the devil wants now, the husband and the husband, and the wife and the wife, and the, uh, uh, the, the fathering person, the, the biologically following person, and the uh, pregnant person. They're not a mother anymore. Now they're, a, they're, they're an expecting persons. It was, what, a, what a joke. The world's winning. Oh, it's, just, it's easy. You look at all that stuff. I was telling uh, our Sunday school class this morning, I said one of the best things uh, I've done for my life here uh, in this year, in the last several months, is I, I just deleted the, the, the news app off my phone. I, I don't even look at it. There's nothing. They don't have anything for me. Nothing's going to help me. Well, don't you want to know? What if, you know? what if there's a tornado coming or something like that? I'll probably know when it's heading my way. I'll know. I'll at least know when it's there. No, there's other ways to get that stuff and get that figured out, but the world's not telling me anything I need to know. They're really not. Really not. I mean, uh, uh, 55 minutes of uh, St. Louis wasted money. The roads haven't been fixed. The taxes are going up. The Cardinals lost again. You know, all that stuff, it doesn't help me. And then for 30 seconds, it's, well, someone rescued this one puppy, this one place, and isn't that uh, for our, and now you ever heard of it? And now for our feel good story of the hour, one. Yeah. It just feels like the world's winning. You look everywhere and well, the devil wins in there. But let me remind you before we get too deeply into that, you know, the Lord, he told us that this is the way it was going to be. He said that men shall wax worse and worse. I know I want things to get better. I want revival. I want all of those things. But I also want God's will for the timeline that he has established. And he said that things are going to get bad, okay? It's just the way it is. As Christians, it definitely uh, seems like we're swimming against the flow, right? Everyone says, let's go this way. And we go, are you kidding me? No, we're supposed to be going that way. We're swimming against the flow. You see that there in verse number five, where he says, they are of the world, right? Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. So we ought not to get discouraged when worldly people talk about worldly things, and worldly people buy into worldly things. It's not that much of a stretch, church. That people who don't care about God, don't believe in God, haven't accepted Christ as their Savior, that they're going to be enamored with worldly things. I've got to think about that sometimes when I get discouraged and I say, hey, we had a great day in church. And then I watch some sporting event on Sunday and I see it's 50,000 times more people, you know. It's easy to get discouraged about that, but I've got to remember, they're of the world, the world is speaking to them, and so they're going to listen to worldly things. What I'm trying to prevent are those that are not of the world listening to worldly things and following those. That's where we got a real concern here. Yes. Amen. All right? I'm not going to look at the world and let the world be my temperature test to cause me to freak out or not. I'm more concerned about what are God's people doing. And that's what God is watching here tonight. What are God's people doing? Who are they listening to? Who are they allowing to influence their life? And if they're allowing the people who are of the world and you're listening to those people, then we got some serious problems. But even though they're everywhere and it definitely feels like they're the majority, we're the minority, all these things, it doesn't mean that we just lay down and die. It doesn't mean that there's no hope, that all is lost. Well, I guess... Pastor, we might as well just uh, sit down and rest in the blessed assurance and, and just wait for the trumpet to sound, right? Wrong. Wrong. That's not what God is telling us to do. In fact, he gives us hope, even during the difficult times. 
See, the conflict between satanic forces and Christians, it seems to never cease. When God is doing a work through his people, as he's trying to do here in this church, Satan will raise up opposition to God's work. Reminds me of uh, what we see some of the great times during the 1700s and the 1800s. In the, in the 1700s, during the ministry of men like John Wesley, and I know that we don't agree with John Wesley on every single little thing, but John Wesley was a proponent of good revival and, and uh, gave us some great things for the Christian faith as well. But during times of men like that, you know, Satan rose up men like Voltaire and Thomas Paine, the intellectuals who, who fought and, and uh, chose to oppose Christianity. During the 1800s, God used men like Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody, yet, and I could probably throw uh, Charles Finney in that as well, yet during that time, Satan raised up rivals like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young to found the Mormon cult. Charles Russell started the Jehovah's Witness during that time, and Mary Baker Eddy founded the Christian Science Movement. And these cults continue to, to deceive people even today. See, Satan's going to raise up opposition against God when he wants to move. God wants to move in this world. God wants to see folks saved. Don't be so surprised and so flabbergasted and so discouraged when Satan wants to attack what's going on. If we're trying to do things here in our church, as a church, if we want to take a stand and say, we are for the gospel here. We want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's important to us. We're emphatic about it. I'm a little fanatic about it, all right? Amen. That people are lost and dying and going to hell, and we're supposed to try to do something about it. Amen. Okay? So if our church is going to take that stand, both in position and in our, our money and in our giving and our missionary support and all these things, Satan's not going to like that. When your pastor gets up and sticks you in the eye just a little bit and steps on your toes and say, you need to get off the couch and go tell people about Jesus, the devil's going to fight against that. Amen. If we take a stand for holiness and for separation and say, look, we ought not to be like the world. We're supposed to be different. Light is not light if it's dark. Do I need to pull out? The, I need to get a duh sign up here too. I know it's not really good. It's not really professional, but every once in a while it seems mildly appropriate. <laughs> light is not light if it's dark. So if we take a stand for holiness, take a stand for doing what's right, staying away from the world, separating from the world, not going and doing the things that the world gets caught up in, we ought not to be sinning like the world sins. You know, the devil doesn't like that. And he's going to fight against it. The conflict has always been there. But listen, in spite of all the opposition that this world can throw at us, and towards Jesus Christ, and towards Christians as a whole, we have overcome this world, which is that enmity or which is an enemy of God. In John 16, 33, these things have I spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. Why? <laughs> In this world ye shall have tribulation. And that's a promise again. I like the promise this morning. But you know what? Jesus told us we're going to have tribulation. It's not going to be all, all, uh, all roses. He says, you're going to have problems. There's going to be, uh, you're going to make some enemies along the way. No one that's ever tried to accomplish anything didn't find opposition in their path. It's just the way it is. He says, you're going to have tribulation, but, what's it? Be, but be of good cheer. I almost wonder what the timing of how this statement worked. Can you imagine Jesus saying, in this world you shall have tribulation. Everyone went, oh, really? That might have been the end, period. That was the end on his outline. His little bullet point he had in his outline was, hey, just want you to know, you're going to have tribulation. And he watched everyone go, oh, oh, oh. And he goes, but, but be of good cheer, right? Hold on, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. I've overcome the world. We can be overcomers of what this world has. And listen, to remain effective in our fellowship with God, if you want to have a consistent, sustained relationship with God, there's going to have to be an overcoming of the things that Satan throws at us. You're not going to make a decision tonight. No, tonight's the night. God's been working on my heart, Pastor. I'm making a decision. I'm going to grow in fellowship with God. 
Great. And it just gets easier from here on out. The hardest part is making the decision. Wrong. To make the decision is to make the decision to overcome. Because temptation is still going to be there. Satanic attacks are still going to be there. Discouragement is still going to be there. Illness might still be there. A rainy day might still be there. Aching joints might still be there. There's going to be bad news that's going to come into our life. And things are going to war against that desire to want to spend time with God. So for you to effectively have fellowship with God every single day of your life, you're just going to have to overcome some things. But God promises that that overcoming is possible. The victory is there. And we cannot allow Satan's attacks to continue to derail us and keep us away from a relationship with God. The, one of the biggest issues we face in modern Christianity and modern church building now to see just people make it to go from the I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior step to I follow the Lord in believer's baptism step to I desire now to, to be discipled and to learn more about Jesus Christ and learn more about His Word and learn more about why God gave us the church in general and to, to grow in my faith and grow in my knowledge of God, to now take that step and then eventually move on beyond that step, folks, there's a step beyond that, okay, to move beyond that step into now I'm going to begin helping others with these things Amen. and teach and spread God's Word to other people. And build that deeper relationship, not only with God, but to reach out. Okay? But what's hindering us with this? People just don't want to overcome sin. They'll say it, but they're not willing to take the necessary steps to get it gone from their life. When you... Talk to somebody about a particular sin that they're dealing with and you say, well, what if you just cut this out or don't go there or don't hang around them? And you watch in, in just milliseconds of their brain, you watch a spiritual battle take place. You watch their wants conflict with God's word. And I have to say that more often than not, they'll tell me to my face or they'll tell you to your face, Okay, well, I'm going to work on this in their heart. But by the time they make it back to their car, they've already given up. Whether it's a lack of belief that God can really give them victory in their life and they actually can overcome the world. And they just don't really believe that. Pastor, you don't know how long I've been in this state. It's been, it's been so long. It's so hard. I, I don't think I'm ever going to break free from this. Well, Jesus said that you can have victory over this world. And to have a consistent fellowship with God. I'm not saying that you stop sinning at some point. I'm saying that there's going to have to be a whole lot of resistance to what Satan is putting in your path. And every single time we show the enemy that we're vulnerable to attack, that we're vulnerable to that temptation, he's just going to keep throwing it at you over and over and over and over and over. This afternoon I was... Watching a little bit of a baseball game. It wasn't the Cardinals. I'm not going to pay crazy amounts of money every month to watch a Cardinals game. But there was a baseball game on. I was watching it a little bit. And there was a batter up there. He's a very aggressive batter. He doesn't like to take a lot of pitches. He's a free swinger. And I watched that pitcher. He was throwing him sliders. If you know anything about baseball. Slider is kind of a harder pitch, but it's got a sharp dip down and away from the arm side of the pitcher. So a right-hander, it's going to go straight, and then, I don't know, 50 feet or uh, five feet or so before the plate, it just, boom. It's a very tough pitch to hit and a tough pitch to lay off of. And I watched that batter take the first strike. It was down 0-1 in the count. And now the pitcher's got the advantage. And I watched that pitcher just throw that slider right. It looked good, man. It was right on the outside corner of the plate. And that guy, you just watch his eyes light up, man. Just, and as he's coming through with that bat, whoop, there it went. By the time the ball was prepared to be hit, it was a foot off the plate. Not even close. He couldn't even reach it with the bat if he wanted to. He swung at it. 0-2. Oh 
One strike to go. Let me ask you something. What do you think that pitcher threw next? He threw that ball again. You know what that batter did? And the, and the commentators were talking about it. He said, ah, his name was Estrada. He said, Estrada's a free swinger. He's struggling with that pitch. I bet they give it to him again. Guess what? Gave it to him again, even farther outside. He still swung at it. Back to the bench you go. That's what the devil does to us. He hangs those little balls out there for us and they look kind of good, but on closer inspection, you'll see that it's kind of trailing out of the strike zone. And what are we doing? <sighs> Why is it? What happened? How come I didn't hit the ball? It was a bad pitch. I didn't hit the ball. You know what Satan does? Hmm. You like that, do you? Wait till you see it again. And, and you know, if, if, if sports players and scouts and things can figure that out, hey, he can't, he can't hit the curveball. Guess what we're throwing him all game? We're going to keep throwing him curveballs until he proves to us he can hit it. That's just the way it is. A basketball player has no mid-range jumper. They can, maybe they're good at shooting three-pointers. Maybe they're good at layups and dunks, but they can't shoot a mid-range shot. Guess what those defenders are going to do? They're going to give them that shot all day, every day. Bam! Hitting the backboard, hitting the rim, airballing it. Sorry for the sports reference tonight. I think you get the understanding. The devil's going to keep throwing that pitch to you and you're going to keep swinging at it and you're going to end up finding yourself on the bench over and over and over yes. and over again. And eventually the good, the good hitters, the ones that make it a long time in baseball and make all the millions of dollars, you know what they learn to do eventually? Lay off the pitch. Don't swing. Oh, it looks so good. But you know what it is? It's a ticket back to the bench. That's what it is. We're going to have to learn to start overcoming some of Satan's attacks in our life. You cannot go through this perpetual cycle of deep in sin again, got to dig my way out. Deep in sin again, got to dig my way out. Deep in sin again, got to dig my way out. That is not a sustainable way to have fellowship with God. It's certainly not going to grow. You're just going back to step one all the time. But he told us that God is greater than all these things. He's overcome all these things. You know what it means? God is greater than all the atheists and the agnostics. Oh, I don't know if we believe in God. God's not faced by that. He's greater than them. And they'll bow the knee and they'll confess that Jesus Christ is Lord just like the rest of us. God's greater than all the scoffers and the scorners that are out there in this world. You guys are strange. You went to church on a Sunday night? Why would you do? Go out and drink? Well, that worked out great for you, didn't it? Hey, you might be a little bit tired going back to work tomorrow, but hopefully at least you won't be hung over. Don't talk to me, don't talk to me, don't talk to me, leave me alone. Maybe you have one of those you know every Monday morning. Yeah, they've been out all weekend. You're, you're crazy for doing that. You're, you're a fanatic. You're in a cult. Yeah. How many people are stuck in the cult of alcoholism and stuck in the cult of meth? Amen. Stuck in the cult of, of, of wasting their money away. Stuck in the cult of abusing their families and losing their licenses and killing people on the road and, and waking up in places they don't know how they got there. We're the strange ones, though, I know, because we're going to go home to our families and have a good night together and then start our week again tomorrow. I, it was so strange. They're of the world. They're hearing things of the world. They listen to the world. Don't let it discourage you. Worry about what you can do with what the devil is throwing at you, and you can overcome it. Amen. He's greater than all the scoffers. He's greater, guess what, than your and I's failures and weaknesses. Amen. I'm just, I just don't know if I can. Okay, then do it in God's power instead. Amen. I just don't know if I, if, I, if I should. Is he calling you? Is he telling you that's what you're supposed to be? Is that telling you? Uh, I just don't know if I can give up that sin. Is God telling you you need to get rid of it? Then he will supply what you need to get through that and get over it. He will not call you into disobedience. Amen. Yes. God calls us into repentance and obedience. He does not call us into disobedience. He will not give you something that you cannot obey. 
If he says you can overcome the sin, you can overcome the sin. He's greater than persecution. There's coming a day not too long down now that churches, even churches that you feel like are a little bit out of the ways and you think we're sheltered and from things like that, they're going to come under more and more persecution. God's greater than those things. If he could build a church during the first century AD, during the time of their persecution, he can build a church today. He's greater than the wicked culture of society, this upside down world that we live in, where wrong is right and right is wrong, and men are women and women are men. We don't know the difference. We can't tell. We don't know what in the world we're supposed to do about all that. And everyone's afraid to speak up because you don't want to be labeled as, as hateful. I prefer the term truthful. Amen. Truth has become hate in this modern day. God's greater than even the unfruitful times. If we try to serve God and I just don't feel like we're making any headway right now. Trust me, I know. In almost the four years we've been together, it's been some two steps forward, five steps backward, five steps forward, four steps backward, three steps forward once. It's just, it's just back and forth sometimes and things go great and then things... Ugh. Some of that's just life. It's just the ebbs and flows of ministry. It's going to be that way every once in a while. But, you know, God is greater than even the unfruitful times. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't let the devil win and get you out of the fight. I tell you what, you're doing a lot more just being faithful where you are than by hanging it up. Don't disqualify yourself out of that ministry and quit. When a Christian quits, Satan rejoices. We got another one. Proverbs talks about this. He says, it's kind of like the deceitful and unscrupulous market worker that says, it is not, it is not, saith the buyer. In other words, he's telling somebody, this isn't worth very much. This, isn't, uh, this is not that big of a deal. Let me have it for a good price. And they say, when he gets it, then he rejoiceth. He's deceitful and thinking, this isn't worth anything. This isn't a big deal. Uh, just let me have this for a couple dollars. When they say, oh, really? Oh, okay. Hey, you can have that. And they walk away going, ha ha, what a steal. That's what the devil is doing in our life. He's telling you that you're not worth much. He's telling you that you don't deserve to serve God. He's telling you that you're incapable of being uh, a fruitful worker for God. He's lying to you. He's lying to you. And instead of overcoming those lies, we bite hook, line, and sinker on those things. Right. And then when he's got us, and he's got our life, and we're not in the ministry, we're not serving, we're not following God anymore, he's like, <laughs> you know what he tells? He tells God, hey, look, I got them too. I thought you weren't worth anything. I thought you didn't matter. That's what he tells you. And then when he takes you out of God's care and he takes you out of fellowship with God, you know what the devil does? He throws you up in his face. He says, look, I got them too. Ha ha. I got that Sunday school teacher. I got that deacon. I got that worker. I got that pastor. I got that person. You know, they told, he told them to their face that they weren't worth anything. Right. And then to God, he marches you around like a trophy. Look who I got. Yeah. I got them to quit. I got them to get deep into sin and disqualify themselves. They can't be used anymore. They're so discouraged. Look who I got. Don't worry about it. You're not worth anything. Don't worry about it. God says you can overcome all these things. Let me give you just a few of the tools for overcoming the world. We're going to spend a couple weeks on this. We got to get deeper into this because I feel like this is such an important part of this day and age that we live in. And it's what's keeping us from really making some headway in our spiritual life is allowing sin to overcome us over and over and over and over. But let me give you a few of the tools tonight and then we'll get into this deeper later on. The first tool that we have for overcoming the world is just the goodness of God. The goodness of God, where he tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 21, right? But to not overcome evil, uh, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. We can overcome the evil in this world by just being that bright and shining light. Being the difference maker. Amen. We can also overcome the world tonight by our faith in God. Can I remind you what it says there in 
if you look over just a page or so, maybe in your Bible in chapter number five, and look with me in verse number four. For whatsoever is born of God, what? Overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. How do we do it? Even our faith. Faith is that, it's that currency. I've said this multiple times in preaching over the years. Faith is the currency that God's power runs on. Amen. You want to see God break out his bank account and, and start in, in influencing us with his power and his might? Deposit some faith into there. Faith got people healed during Jesus' time. Yes. Faith got people raised from the dead during Jesus' time. Faith gets people saved every single day of the week. It unlocks God's power. Yes, amen. Faith is what motivates us to overcome this world. How, how, why should I even try? Well, my faith in God tells me that I can do this. My faith in God is that God is powerful. God is on my side. God loves me. I'm not doing this alone. And therefore, I am energized to overcome what Satan is going after me with. Number three, I, I can overcome the world through my belief in Jesus Christ. You read the next verse there, verse number five. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the focal point of that faith in verse number four. Having faith, well, I have faith in God. All right, that's a great universal blanket statement. Why do we have faith in God? We have faith in God because he sent us his son, Jesus Christ. That was the ultimate fulfillment of his promise. If God is willing to do that for us, everything else after it is much, much, much easier. He's tackled salvation, the biggest problem. Bigger than the bill. Bigger than your, uh, uh, all the difficulties. Bigger than a temptation of sin. Jesus was sent to overcome all of that. If you believe that he is that son of God, that he loves you deeply and personally, that he gave his life for you so you could live victoriously in this life. If you believe it, if you put your faith in it, then believe him when he tells you that you can overcome the world with his power. Number four, finally tonight, in our tools to overcome the world, we can overcome the world in the strength that Christ then provides for us. If you're thinking tonight that I'm trying to rev you up and get you energized so you can go out there and tackle the world, please don't misunderstand me. You cannot go out there alone. You cannot go out there alone. I understand getting an emotional high. And, uh, all right, we're going to go after it. We're charging hell with a squirt gun tonight. You know, we're going to make it happen. I love the passion. I love the zeal. It's great, but it's a recipe for disaster if you go alone. Amen. If you go alone. I cannot pastor this church without the power of God, and you cannot attend this church effectively without the power of God either. It's not just for me. It's not just for the leaders. It's for you. We need the power of God in our life. Not on Sunday, not on Wednesday, but on every day. Amen. All the days that end in day. Those are the ones. We need to overcome this world through the strength that Christ provides for us. What's he say there in Philippians chapter 4? Verse 13. Maybe you've got it on the mug. Maybe you've got it on your wall. Maybe you've got it cross-stitched into a pillow somewhere where he tells us that I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I'm not trying to take that verse out of context, but what God is telling us in the overview of that section, he's telling us that you should not let this world be a defeating force in your life. But it's everywhere. I know. Good. It shouldn't sneak up on you then. None of us can say, I just didn't know that sin was out there to get me. Sin is not this assassin that comes in the night. It's knocking on your door all the time. You know it's there. It's your neighbor. Maybe literally and physically. I don't know. It's everywhere. So we shouldn't be shocked by it. Shouldn't sneak up on us. We should, I can't believe that there was sin out there to try to get me. We know it's there. God says, look, it's everywhere around you, but you can Find victory. 
You've got to believe the truth. If you don't have the faith that I can't help you, there's no points I can give you. There's no poem I can read. There's no fancy story to push on. I can't talk about any more lions and birds in the mouth. It's not going to help you if you don't believe that Christ is greater than these things. Amen. Why should we have fellowship with God? You need to build the relationship with Christ so your faith grows and your courage grows with it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man... But God is what? If you know it. Faithful. faithful. He's faithful when you use him. Listen to me now. He's faithful when you use him. God is not rushing in as your savior without your... Uh, God's just going to rescue me in the last moment from all the damages of my sin. No, he's told you what you need to do. He's given you the tools of what you need to do. He's given you the commands in his word. He's expecting you to obey him and follow him. If you do not call out in repentance, if you do not call out and try to get overcoming of that sin, he, he's not going to rescue you from the damages of sin. We're under that sin curse still now. Maybe not for all of eternity, but where we live right now, sin is still affecting us. And yes, God is faithful. But he's faithful when we use him. He says he's not going to suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able. Hold on, it doesn't stop there, right? Why is that the case? God didn't say that you weren't going to be strongly tempted. He didn't say that. God didn't say that there wasn't going to be besetting sins, pet sins, little white sins, whatever you want to call them. Right. Amen. The ones that are real hard to tackle. God didn't say there wasn't going to be deep sin opportunities. He says you're going to have sin opportunities in your life. There, it's going to affect every person. But God is faithful because he's not going to suffer you to be tempted that which you're able. Why? Because there's no temptation. God's just going to take all the temptation away from my life. No. 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 He wants you to choose him. He wants you to choose him. Ladies, that, that love for, that your husband has for you, it doesn't mean quite as much if you eliminate every other woman on the planet. Thank you for choosing me, honey. You were the only choice. What makes it so special? At every point in time, at that point in time in our life, we had a choice, didn't we? And we chose them. That's what makes that love between two people so special. God wants you to choose him. So he's faithful, yes, to allow us to not be tempted that which we're able. How does he do that now, though? How does he do that? But with the temptation, temptation's coming. It's happening. Also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. That term bear is a victory over, to take the attack and become victorious anyhow. Sounds like overcoming to me. So the victory only happens when you use the tools that God gave you. Church, if you're not going to be obedient to this book, and you're not going to follow the principles, and you're not going to change your life to line up with God's way, you will not find consistent, real, meaningful fellowship with God. You'll live your life on breadcrumbs and never enjoy what the main course with God really is. So you're going to have to ask yourself, what do you want more? What do you want more? If we're honest with ourselves, our actions prove that we want to have our cake and eat it too. I want to be able to kind of do a few things every now and then and then just run to repentance and expect... Look, the, the forgiveness is there, yes. But we don't build meaningful relationships with anybody when we continually hurt them over and over and over and over. And there may be restoration. Yeah, I forgive you. But God is not going to pour his blessing out on your life if you're not overcoming some sin. Because you're signaling to him that you're not willing to use his word in an effective way in your life. That these things are rescue principles 
not living principles. This is, the, uh, this is my emergency manual, pastor. No, this is supposed to be your manual of operations. Amen. This isn't the FEMA book. This isn't for when the hurricane comes, when the tornado comes. This is Monday morning. This is Thursday afternoon. This is Saturday morning. This is, this is daily. Daily operational principles. You want to get consistent fellowship with God. Being in church, that's a great part. You're making good decisions. I'm not as concerned about what's happening right here in this moment. I'm worried about when we leave. When we get back into that same cycle. Uh, I don't know if I said no to sin a lot this week. And we wonder why we just can't get victory over it. Hey, try to hit this. Whew. There we go. Back to the bench. Back to the bench. And Satan's like, man, these people are dumb. These people are dumb. They swing every time. And we sit here and go, why, why can't I find God's blessing? Why can't God use me? And then you look at us corporately as a whole, as a church, how God judges us and looks at what Does God do that? Have you read the book of Revelation? God looks at churches as a whole. And when he looks at us, does he see some overcoming? Or does, he, does he see a whole lot of people stuck in the rut of sin? I'm so sorry, God. Repeat. We're as silly as the sheep. My wife knows that she loves showing me this, this video every time it comes up. The plight of the shepherd. Pulling the sheep out of the big ditch for the sheep to run in a circle and dive headlong right back into the ditch again. That's who we are. God has got us nailed to a T. You're sheep! Yeah. Church, would you work with me on this? I'm working on this in my life whether it's the little nagging sins, the knowing ones, the unknowing, whatever it may be in your life, we've got to go to war with this thing. And I'm not going to let the cycle continue over and over. And the devil's just going to keep hitting you in that weak spot until you shore it up. Now, he's not going to stop attacking you. We know in this world you shall have tribulation. He'll move. He'll move to another spot. It's time to adjust the strategy and start working on that now. But there's some of us in this room that have probably been dealing with certain sins in your life for decades. What's it going to take? What's it going to take? I know in my life, when I pray and ask God for certain things and I need prayer requests answered, He just, He nails me. My eyes just, what about that? And He'll tell you to me so often, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? You really want this place to be something special in our area? Not because we're wealthy or influential or have the biggest building on the block. I'm not talking about that. Do you want our church to be something that's generationally amazing that Jefferson County just didn't know it hit it? It was like a revival bomb went off in this area. Amen. Yes, we're sinners we got to stop excusing our sin nature as a reason for us to be dirty vessels all the time. God bless me. Go take a bath. Clean yourself up. You know where that dirt comes from, right? You've been running around the pig pen again. Oh, God, help me, please. All right, go take a bath. You're clean. Great. Where are you going? Back out to the field. Some traction forward. Holiness does a lot for that. Let's overcome this week. You know, it's, it's hard to make these massive goals. I'm going to get everything right this week. Well, be careful. Don't disappoint yourself. Maybe single something out. One thing in your life. This week is the week I'm going to start working on getting that gone. It's done. I'm negative all the time, Pastor. i got a bad spirit. Okay, let's start working on that. That's not helping anybody. 
I've got this one sin, but it's hard. I've got this one person that's still hanging around in my life, and I probably need to get rid of them. Let's start working on that. Let's, it's time. It's time to overcome. Because God promised you a way of escape. That means that we will be held accountable for these choices that we make. None of us will be able to stand before God and say, I just couldn't help it. No. I gave you the tools. I gave you my word. I gave you the principles. What did you follow? Did you consider overcoming some sin with me? Hey, we're good people, Pastor. We're in church on a Sunday night. Yep, just a room full of sinners. That's who we are. We got work to do. All of us. Lord, you know, all of us got work to do. Let's start on that this week, doing some overcoming. And let's, let's give the devil a, a curveball of our own. Hey, wait a second. They stopped doing what I told them to do. Let's make him sweat it for a little while. Let's make him do some work. We're carrying out his will and trying to claim Christ. Lord, would you please help us with this? Lord, in my life, I want to be clean before you. I'm not a perfect man, just like all the men here. My wife, she's not a perfect lady, just like all the ladies here. It doesn't matter what a title is. Our staff, we're, they're sinners too. It doesn't matter if they're a brand new Christian in this room or whoever's been saved the longest. Lord, we all have areas, I'm sure, that are disappointing to you. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us so much to rejoice over. Lord, I pray, please, that we'd find some victories over the sins in this life. Lord, help us to pray for others, not, not hypocritically, Lord, but there are many in this, in this church, Lord, young Christians, new believers, they're fighting some strong battles against some things. And Lord, I pray that we would lift them up to you. and God, help them, please. Give them grace. Give them courage to make some changes that need to be made. Help us, please, Lord, to be willing to change us, Lord, to gain you. The fellowship with you, Lord, is the prize. I pray, Lord, we'd be willing to do what it takes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you stand together with me? The piano is playing. It's a time of prayer and invitation. If God spoke to your heart about anything today in church, would you pray and seek his face, please? Coming to an altar doesn't make you any worse of a sinner. It just makes you more sensitive. Everyone here in the room is in the same, same place. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all sinners here. Don't be ashamed. Thank you so much for the response of your people tonight. Thank you for the day that we've had in church. Lord, I pray that we would get some victory over some things in our life this year. The joy and delight, Lord, of an obedient heart and mind before God. It's, it's nice to have a clear conscience before you. I pray you'd help our church. Lord, how, how can we serve you better? How can we build things? How can we grow? How can we raise new work, Lord, if we're doing it with, with willful sinfulness. It just, it can't happen. Lord, we don't deserve your blessings if we're not willing to repent when we need to repent. I pray you'd help us when we need your strength. I, we can't do it alone, as we said tonight. I, I pray, God, that you would be there with us. We, we need your Holy Spirit to guide us. Uh, I know in my life, I've said you multiple times, Holy Spirit, you've got, you've got, leeway in my life. Just tell me, please. I want to know. I pray that we'd yield to him and his voice. He's the gift you gave us to direct us back to you. And I pray that we'd be sensitive to his leading. And Lord, I pray that we'd be a holy church before you. Please bless this place. Bless our efforts, God. Help us to march forward. Be victorious. Pray you'd use these people, sweet people, Lord, kind people. They're, Lord, they... 
I believe they, they're here tonight because they love this place. They want to see it succeed. They want to see you use it. God, I pray that we do the part that we can control. And we just keep our hearts and minds clear before you. Thank you for the opportunity to be in church, both these services today. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to you this week as we go forward. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Can you be seated, please, if you would? Thank you for being in church. and um, appreciate uh, all the time we've got to spend together today. I hope you've enjoyed uh, all the fellowship, singing, and everything. It's been a blessing. Uh, we're going to enter into our business meeting in just a moment, so we need to say goodbye to those folks who are watching on, online in our live